Good morning, church. We're in the Gospel of John this morning. We're going to look at quite a few different passages, actually. But uh, most of them are in John, so we're going to jump around a little bit. This is a message which I have been meditating on for a while, and it comes out of questions that I've asked myself for a long time, ever since giving my heart to the Lord, ever since uh, choosing to join the Fellowship of the Adventist Church, some of the questions that have, that have led to my meditation on this topic. And we're going to start here in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31, 32, and 36. Jesus, of course, is dialoguing with the Jews, with the Pharisees, and uh, as it usually went in such a case, it wasn't always the easiest of conversations, and uh, he got himself into a whole lot of trouble for saying these words. And so here we go, John chapter 8 from verse 31, 32, and 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, You are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. There are a number of uh, concepts tied up together here. We have the person of Jesus. He brings freedom. We have the concept of truth, which brings freedom. We have the concept of the word because his disciples are instructed to abide in his word. And the word is connected to truth because immediately after he says, you are my disciples, if you abide in my word, he goes on to say, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And then you have the idea of discipleship. Discipleship, the word, truth, and the person of Jesus. Interesting combination of ideas here. In essence, what he is saying to to these folks, to these Jews, these, of course, are the ones who believed him in the positive, in the hearing of those who were challenging him and disagreeing with him, is he is saying to him, truth is paramount to the concept of freedom. Truth is paramount to the concept of freedom. You cannot be free without being in truth. Now, this is a very interesting concept. It's interesting that Jesus himself puts such weight on it. And we'll go to a few other texts in a few few moments that will really add emphasis to what Jesus is saying here. It's interesting in the 21st century because the idea in the 21st century has departed somewhat from the idea of the truth shall make you free. The emphasis now is on Jesus shall make you free. Now, you're thinking, Adrian, what's wrong with that? Surely you're not going to stand up there as a minister of the gospel, and say, that's not true. No, I'm not. Indeed, that's what Jesus himself said. The Son shall make you free. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. But there is a casual use of the term in Christianity in general. There is a very blasé, no substance to the meaning of this idea that Jesus shall set you free. Because I ask you, who is Jesus aside from truth? What do you know about Jesus aside from revealed truth? You know nothing except the name. Nothing except the name. The devil himself would be happy for you to call him Jesus. If that's what it would take to get you to worship him. He doesn't mind you calling him Jesus. As long as you don't understand the substance of that name. Is it true that if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed? I would say to you, absolutely. But my question is, do you know who the Son is? My question is, do you know the Jesus who makes you free? Do you know more than merely the name Jesus? Do you call on the very being of Jesus or do you just profess the name of Jesus? I want to challenge this idea that we have in Christianity today That truth takes a second place. It's just all about the casual mention of the name of Jesus. And that therefore we as a people, Seventh-day Adventists, raised up in a prophetic message for this time in earth's history as a movement akin to that of John the Baptist to warn the world and prepare it for the coming of of the Messiah, that we could somehow align ourselves with this sort of a movement. We call it the ecumenical movement. 
The ecumenical movement is the idea that, hey, let's not talk about our differences. Let's not study the Bible to, to differentiate between what is truth and error. Let's get together on the lowest common denominator amongst us all. And usually, usually that's on the feel-good emotional element combined with happy-go-lucky music styles and uh, that sort of a celebration-style worship. It's usually oriented around touchy-feely, emotional, warm, fuzzy things without much substance of the word while claiming the lowest common denominator of belief between us all. And if that's all your Christianity boils down to, friends, let me tell you, you do not have enough to make it through to the kingdom. Now, I want to differentiate between two groups. I want to differentiate between the group that knows better and understands and it has the privilege of truth and the group that does not. I stand in condemnation of no one this morning that has not had opportunity to hear the truth. It is precisely for that group that this church, this movement, this group of people has been raised up on prophetic authority with a message to restore and rebuild the broken down walls and the waste places. We've been raised up specifically for that group to share with them the good news of their full and everlasting gospel that they too may be ready for the coming of Jesus. Which, friends, by the way, is closer than you and I think or acknowledge every day of our lives. It's around the corner. I have been greatly impressed lately, burdened, almost to the point of feeling sick in my soul because I am worried about our preparation. I am worried whether we as a people, the ones who claim the knowledge of the truth, the ones who claim the prophetic calling, the ones who have been raised up with a mission and a message for this world, whether we are ready and prepared to meet the crisis. And I think that the reason we don't have as much influence in the world as we ought to is precisely because of our lack of preparation. It is precisely because we don't have too much to offer. We lack fundamentally in our Christian experience. We're happy to go along with ecumenical ideas and happy to join hands with those who, well, to just be quite honest, have not understood the message of Scripture. I speak not to that group this morning. I do not stand here in condemnation of other churches or other people or other groups. I speak to you this morning. I speak to me this morning. A people who have been privileged, a people who have been called, a people who have been raised up for this time in earth's history, a people who are called Seventh-day Adventists because we believe in the entirety of the law of God, we believe in the Seventh-day Sabbath, and we believe Jesus is coming soon. And I'm asking you, apart from your church membership's name, are you a Seventh-day Adventist in spirit and in truth? I'm troubled this morning, friends. You might have noticed that. I have a sense of urgency this morning. Because time is short. And we are wasting it. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You can call yourself whatever you want. But the condition upon which Jesus Christ recognizes true discipleship is if you're in the Word. If you are obeying the teachings of the Word of God. You can call yourself a follower of Jesus. You can call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist. You can call yourself a Christian. But discipleship goes beyond a profession. It goes beyond the intellectual assent to a set of doctrines. It goes beyond the mere understanding of what the Bible teaches. It goes to a practice of the heart. A disciple is one who walks in the footsteps of the Master. He looks like the Master. He talks like the Master. He believes like the Master. He has the mission of the Master. And it is all centered in the Word. A movement, an organization, a teaching, or a lack of teaching that would base our Christian experience on anything other than the Word and taking us into the truth of God's Word is a counterfeit. And believe me, counterfeits don't come along and say, hey, we're of the devil, please follow us. Counterfeits use the right terms. They call it by the right names. They'll even quote a few good verses. But discipleship is based in the word. You are my disciples. Not if you have warm, fuzzy feelings all the time. 
You are my disciples, not if you have jumped up and down and clapped your hands, spoken in tongues, or had some miraculous exercise of supernatural origin. You are my disciples if you abide in my word. That word abide means to live there, to dwell there, to be saturated with. It means that it is not a casual cursory reading. It means it has been taken in, swallowed in, ingested. It has nourished the being. It is shaping who you are. It guides your thoughts. It guides your decision-making process. Every aspect of your life, your business practices, your school choices, the friends you hang around with, the music you listen to, the movies you watch or choose not to watch, Everything is saturated by the guiding principle of the Word of God. You are my disciples if you abide in my Word. Not visit once or twice, not quote a few cursory texts. If you abide in my Word, dwell there, be saturated by it, be changed by it, absorb it into your being. And then he says, and you will know the truth. See, you cannot know truth apart from the Word. You cannot know truth from the mere warm, fuzzy experience that is sometimes associated with Christian exercises. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The problem with truth is this. It also brings a sword. It also brings a sword. And Jesus references that in other places. Truth may not be easy to follow and truth may not be easy to accept because it demands change and hence the lowest common denominator idea in Christianity. I want to be saved, but not at all costs. I want to be saved because I sure don't want to end up in the hot place. I want to be saved because I want to live forever, but I'm, I, you know, I really, I, you know, truth, it means change. Don't study the word of God Unless you're willing to change. Because it is only going to bring you condemnation. Now that was not an encouragement to not study the scriptures. You understand that, right? I'm asking you to question your motives. I'm asking you to search your heart this morning and say, What am I willing to give to obtain heaven? What was it that Christ gave for me? Some second-rate half-baked gift? He emptied heaven for me. What am I willing to do to get heaven? And don't say to me, just believe. <laughs> That's true. I'm not denying that. But I'm saying, don't say just believe in the same way that people say, Jesus makes you free. Without understanding what it means. To believe in what? To believe in Jesus. Well, who is Jesus? Find out in the Word. You see, he says here, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then he says, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, I want you to turn over to John chapter 14 for a moment. John chapter 14 and verse 6. And notice these words of Jesus. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Happy with that? There's a good solid Christian teaching, right? No one gets to heaven. No one gets to the Father except through Jesus. We're all happy with that. The whole of Christianity is happy with that. But what does that mean? Notice what Jesus has tied it in with. I am the way. I am the life. And sandwiched in between the way and the life is what? The truth. You want to come to Jesus and not search out truth and not be willing to offer up and change whatever in your life demands to be changed by truth. Then you are not following the true Jesus. You are following a Jesus of your own conjuring and of your own imagination. The true Jesus is a Jesus who is based in truth. Now turn over to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Speaking to his disciples in prayer concerning his disciples. In prayer about the end time generation of people. Every disciple from the time of Jesus right down to the end. Is encompassed in John chapter 17's high priestly prayer of Jesus. And notice what Jesus asks of the Father. Sanctify them. Who? The believers. The church of God. Sanctify the disciples. Sanctify those who claim the name of Jesus. Sanctify them how? By your truth. Still, that's, uh, that's still vague. So Jesus clarifies it once more. Your word is truth. The word of God and no other 
can be substituted for it. The word of God and the word of God alone, my friends, is the way of determining truth. And those who are getting ready for the coming of Jesus are those who are sorting their lives out according to the word of God. They are searching the scriptures. They are offering up everything that is contrary to the scriptures and giving themselves over to the sanctifying, the making holy capabilities of the truth of God. Do not miss this fact that truth is central to the being of Jesus. Truth is central to the teachings of Jesus. And truth is central to the fellowship with Jesus, which is known as the discipleship of people or the church. The church is a place of truth because it studies the word which is truth. And it focuses on and surrenders to the person who is truth. And because it is led and empowered by the Spirit who is truth, turn back a page, John chapter 16, verse 13. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come. Not the Spirit of warm fuzzies, not the Spirit of celebration, the Spirit of truth. You want to know where, where, where the Spirit of God is moving, ask yourself where truth is being preached. Where the Word of God is being preached. The book of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 13 tells us that at the end of time, prior to the coming of Jesus, just before and leading up to the final persecution worldwide of God's people, there will be a counterfeit Holy Spirit movement. It speaks about signs and wonders and fire being brought down from heaven. It takes our minds back to Mount Carmel, where the true God was distinguished from the false by fire. It takes us back to the day of Pentecost, where the presence of divinity came down in the form of the Spirit, in the form of tongues of fire upon God's people. It conjures up that in your mind. The difference, though, is that in this case, in Revelation 13, verse 13, it is not the spirit of truth. It is not the Holy Spirit. It is a counterfeit spirit, for it says there that by these signs and wonders, he seeks to deceive. So what happens at the end is the same thing as what happened in the beginning of church's history. The true Holy Spirit was given. True signs, miracles, and wonders were wrought in the presence of people, and it caused them to believe on God. Satan comes along before the true revival that, and, and, and that leads up to the final persecution of God's people, and he pours out upon the world a counterfeit Holy Spirit. And they do what Jesus and the disciples were doing in the beginning of church's history. The only difference is scripture has warned us, you cannot believe what you see simply because you see it. You have to ask yourself, is it truth? The only thing that is going to save you and me, friends, you will not be able to look at it and say, that's wrong because it doesn't look right. And that movement is in our world today. It is no longer future, friends. It is happening. Look at what is happening in Christian circles. Look at what is happening in the world today. And ask yourself, in these churches, in these churches, is truth being proclaimed while the miracles and the gifts apparently are falling? I am not saying that those, those manifestations are not true or somehow they're uh, you know, all phony and made up. I believe they are real. But I do not believe it is the working of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. And it says here in John chapter 16 that when the Spirit, the Spirit of Truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. So where you have divine, apparently divine manifestations, where you have maybe, I don't know, gifts of tongues and of healings and of all these sort of things going on around you, when you have you know, ecstatic utterances and, and exciting things happening and people are swaying and swooning and all sorts of things are going on, and you think to yourself, this is the power of God, you've got to ask yourself, is this leading to the preaching of truth or is it setting the people up to believe a lie? Because the Holy Spirit is not given by the Father to manifest Himself in a place where truth is not being taught. For if He were to do that, He would be an accomplice to error. He would be giving a reason to believe the lie. I do not mean to be harsh or critical of the churches out there. I've already clarified that. There is deception in the world, but I am concerned, friends. Because I've seen throughout history that Adventists themselves are being deceived by this. Because we are no longer studying the word of God like our pioneers. We are no longer concentrating on what is truth. And we're happy to go along with a quasi believe in the ecumenical Jesus. And it's going to kill us. Because we ought to know better. 
Unto this people, you and I have been granted great light, clear prophecies. But we like to drink from the waters of Babylon. What is truth? What is truth and who is Jesus? I want to remind you of what happens in Matthew chapter 7. When they come to him at the end, the picture is of the judgment day. And they say unto him, Lord, Lord. And notice what they say. say, Lord, Lord. Is that then speaking about the non-Christian world who have outright rejected Christ? No. It's speaking of professed Christians. Lord, Lord, we claimed the name of Jesus. We sang in your churches. We preached the word. We prophesied in your name. We we performed miracles in your name. We, We healed in your name. It even says we even cast out demons in your name. Yes, friends, what I want you to be aware of is you cannot even believe it that just because a demon has been cast out of someone, apparently in a church service, that that is necessarily the working of the Holy Spirit. Because the next thing after they've claimed all those things, Lord, Lord, we are your people. We've prophesied in your name. We've performed miracles in your name. We've healed in your name. We have cast out demons in your name. Jesus turns around and he says, depart from me. I do not know you. And you know what the key is? You know what he says? You know what differentiates between the crowd that he knows and the crowd that he denies, although all are Christian and all profess Christianity? He says, you who practice lawlessness. You practice sin. You give okay to sin. You think it's all right. You teach the breaking of the commandments. They've been nailed to the cross. Don't worry about the Sabbath. Lay it down. Don't worry about it. Oh, Jesus paid it all. You don't have to worry about a thing. Now again, I'm saying to you, yes, Jesus paid it all. But do you know what that means? Because if to you that means a license to continue in sin, then you have not believed the gospel of salvation by grace through faith. These are urgent times, friends. Urgent times. All around us are being fulfilled the prophetic utterances. We already see the movings in our world of this false counterfeit spirit, the false revival, and the assurance given in the book called Great Controversy, which some of you may know, is that that's exactly what will happen before the true Holy Spirit is poured out in the latter rain. That's how close you and I are to the end. And we are sleeping. Do you know truth? That's the wrong question. Have you received truth into your heart? Do you know the truth as it is in Jesus, the one who personifies the truth? I remember once upon a time, approximately 12 or 13 years ago now, I was sitting on the side of a mountain. My legs had given in. I could no longer walk. I was too high on drugs. We had taken way too much that day, and myself and my friends had collapsed on the side of the road. We were done for, basically. So we propped ourselves up on the, up on the side because people, you know, it's a place where people hike and all the rest, try to look as natural and as normal as possible because we realized we were in a fair amount of trouble. That day, God revealed himself to us in a very marked, remarkable manner. One thing led to another. It's a long story I don't have time to get into, but we were sitting on that mountain as heathen as heathen could be. When God saw fit in his grace to visit with us in our drug-induced state of high at a place where we were about to kiss the lips of the death angel. And he offers us a second chance and we accept that second chance. Long story made short. And we're sitting there and the question comes into my mind. If this is the God who so loved us that he would not give up on us but he would come and seek us and find us right here where we are hopeless and about to die... How can I turn my back on him? But how do I get to know him more? I don't know if you've ever had moments of conviction. Moments where, you know, something flashes into your mind. It's no audible voice. You don't see angels. There's no sign writing on the, on, on the sky. But you know as well as anybody else that that was not in your mind. I mean, you're asking the question because you don't have the answer. And then the answer is flashed into your mind. That is the working of the Holy Spirit. And the answer flashes into my mind. And the answer is... Go and read the Bible. Oh, read the Bible. Great answer. Yeah. Uh, Lord, I don't know if you know how I got through school, but uh, I used to sit next to that guy, remember, 
actually, I didn't used to read much at all. I kind of um, used to borrow, so I, reading's a bit of a challenge. I had to read the Bible with a dictionary to understand what it was saying. But I wanted to know the God who is truth. And this word is truth. It is the only way to be sure that you have not believed in a counterfeit. All will claim the name of Jesus, but not all know the person of Jesus. The next question in our minds was, okay, so if the word is the Bible, if the Bible is the word and the word is truth and we need to study the Bible to get to know this Jesus, okay, great. I guess this means we have to go back to church, right? Now, we hadn't been to church for years, for many years. And we knew what the faces of the saints would look like the day we walked in. But we realized just the same way that the idea of the truth of the word was impressed on our mind, that just as strongly and poignantly, fellowship is essential. No man is an island. And the doctrine that you can go it alone in Christianity and you don't need the fellowship of, of, of the saints is a, is a satanic doctrine. It is not found in Scripture. You need the fellowship of believers. That's why Christ himself formed the body. To deny that and think you can go it alone is to say you're wiser than the Lord. You need the fellowship of like-minded believers. So just as the word was impressed upon our minds, we, know, we knew we needed the community now of faith to strengthen us. After all, we were just starting on this journey. It was a great start, but it was really just the beginning. And so we think to ourselves the next important question, which is, well, which church do we go to? You know, there's a million and one in my hometown. And then our early upbringing kicked in. All those times I thought I was ignoring the preacher and sleeping through church kicked in. And a very simple answer came into our minds. And it was unanimous in this group of friends. It was just the weirdest thing. There was no argument. There was no debate. It was as if we were all impressed in exactly the same way. Adrian, you've got to find a place which worships on Sabbath. And it's in the Word, right? There's only one Sabbath. And so immediately we know which church we've got to go to. The Seventh-day Adventist church. That was the beginning of an interesting journey for me. All I knew at that point was that they taught the Sabbath. Does that make sense? And the Sabbath is commanded in the law of God. It's taught throughout Scripture. And so if you're going to be associated with, a, with, with, with the person of truth who is Jesus, and you're going to abide in the Word of God which is truth, and if you're going to uh, receive of the Holy Spirit who is the Spirit of truth, then it only makes sense that you associate with the people of truth. And so we end up back at the Seventh-day Adventist church and we start studying. And I want to, I want to, I want to show you a few things here. All we knew at that point was that this church called the Seventh-day Adventist Church, well, they taught the Sabbath and, and, and the others didn't. And so by that one, by that principle of truth alone, it really narrows down your choice. Does that make sense? You don't have a whole lot of choice after that. There may be one or two options outside of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But the reality is, once you settle the issue of the truth and the law of God, and you, you take that principle into account, automatically all the others fall away as the, as the true organized body of believers. Now listen carefully to me. That was not a statement about the genuineness of the faith of those who are in those places. God has His people and His faithful people in every church, in every denomination. They have not yet heard or understood truth, but they are living up to the light which they have received. You know the story, right? Are we clear on that? But there is a place of truth to which God calls the people of truth who receive Jesus the person of truth and abide in the word of truth and are guided by the spirit of truth. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be a minister of this church. I do not say it in a sense of exclusivism. I say it in a sense of invitation to all who are hungering and thirsting for the truth. Who are sick of being lied to even in the spiritual world. And all I knew at that point was that on that basis alone, this issue of truth and the Sabbath day, it narrowed down our choices entirely. And then I discovered a whole lot of other things. I want you to go over to the book of Revelation and focus for me a little bit, uh, with me a little bit on this prophetic movement that God has raised up. And I started to study the book of Revelation. 
revelation. And I, I found out a whole lot of other things that confirmed me in this. That though many in the world and many in Christian churches have strange things to say about this church, have all sorts of names for it, you cannot get away from the fact that in, in the prophecies of Scripture, it is clearly foretold to arise. It says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, that the dragon was enraged with the woman, went off to make war with the rest of her offspring, the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this is quite amazing, friends, because here we are on the mountainside. We don't know this prophecy yet. Are you with me? We haven't studied the book of Revelation. We really don't know Genesis from Revelation. When I became a Christian, I had to memorize the books of the Bible because I didn't know where they were. And I was raised in a Seventh-day Adventist home. Parents, do not assume that your children have an experience with the Lord. Work for it. Work towards it. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Do not assume that because they are raised in an Adventist home and brought to an Adventist church that they understand biblical truth. That they automatically have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Young people, do not assume that you can just go through your life on your parents' faith. At some point, you must evaluate truth and righteousness for yourself. You must take a stand. And to take no stand is to take a stand. So here we are, we are studying the word of God now. We, we read these verses, we come across this, and we're confirmed that the impression in our mind, the impression in our mind is in harmony with the word of God. Are you with me? The dragon was angry with the woman, the church. He went off to make war with her, because that woman, that church, is not in, her, in his camp. It's not worried about the rest who do not keep the commandments of God, for they are in error. They are in his camp. He's worried about the one that stands to be a threat to his kingdom. He goes to make war with the remnant of her seed from the inside and from the outside. It matters not. Weaken them, demoralize them. Just get them out of the word of truth. You can identify them because they keep the commandments and they have the testimony of Jesus, which when you go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, you find an interesting story where the angel that is speaking to John comes along. John falls down to worship him and the angel says this, I am your fellow servant. Do not do that. Do not worship me. Don't fall at my feet and give me homage because I am your fellow servant. That means, that means I am just like you, John. You and I are equals in the mission of God. You see? You and I are fellow servants and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Same phrase. Worship God. And then he says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So notice what's happening here. Here in the context of the prophecy being given to John, he's receiving the spirit of prophecy. There is an angel which is tasked with the same uh, the same task, the Spirit is giving John prophecy to record for us. An angel is sent with the same gift of prophecy to reinforce what John is seeing in vision. And so when John, of course, falls down because he's just this bright, dazzling being and so on, he thinks it must be Jesus, doesn't know the difference in his ignorance. The being corrects him and he says, listen, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, the testimony of Jesus is having the gift of prophecy in your midst. Are you with me? The end time people of God are not only a people who keep the commandments of God, but they are like the angel and like John in that they would have a manifestation of the spirit of prophecy in their midst. And another time we'll talk about a woman by the name of Ellen White. A fulfillment of that prophecy. God warned us ahead of time, the gift of prophecy is not going to disappear from the church. I will have the gift of prophecy right down to the end, and that will be manifested amongst the true followers of God. You go over to chapter 14, and you read the following. It speaks about the people of God at the end of time. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. It's there again, and the faith of Jesus. 
In other words, they are not a legalistic bunch that seek to earn their own salvation. They're not trying to make it on their own. They have the commandments of God. They believe in righteousness by faith through the merits of Jesus Christ. They are an authentic, grace-based, faith-oriented Christian movement, trusting entirely in their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But they believe that through that experience with Jesus, grace is imbued to them to lift them up out of the pit and the mire of sin. They come back into harmony with the keeping of the commandments of God, and they have a real life manifestation of the gift of prophecy in their midst to guide them through the perils of the last days. And then they say, all churches are equal. It doesn't matter where you go. Does it match up with the word of God? It matters, friends. It matters. Because truth matters. Because there is a counterfeit Jesus. And there is a counterfeit Holy Spirit movement. And it's calculated to deceive. The last deception of Satan is going to be the most subtle and the most persuasive of all of them. You think he's going to show up and say, Hi, I'm the devil and I really want to convince you that in the Garden of Eden I was right and God was actually wrong, so please follow me. Adam and Eve fell for that one. He's not going to do it again. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 11? Where in the context of warning against false teachers inside the church... Inside the professed body of Christ, where, where Paul says, these are false ministers, false apostles. He understands that the people of God are going to go, how can that be? This is the Christian church. They, that God wouldn't allow that. He says, and do not marvel over the fact that human beings impersonate true teachers and are actually false teachers. Because guess what? Even Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. So if their master does it, you can be sure they will do it. Do you get what I'm saying to you? He's saying, don't be surprised. At the end of time, the threat within Christianity is not going to be the Hindus or the Muslims or the external sources. Within this great big body of believers, so-called professed Christians, that's where you're going to have to keep your eyes peeled. And that's where you're going to need the truth of God's word. For well, they all professed to follow Jesus. They all professed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They all professed to preach from the word of God. But they were not teaching truth. And they were living in lawlessness. Depart from me, for I never knew you. And in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that prophetic chaos of the end days, that subtle deception, God raises up a prophetic movement who seek to restore obedience to God and all His commandments, including the fourth. A movement who believes entirely and utterly that despite the obedience to the commandments, you can do nothing to save yourself. You have to entire, in, re rely entirely upon Jesus. But in that reliance comes a source of power. And that group is given the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, who leads them in to all truth, and actually manifests himself in a very direct, guiding, principled fashion called the, the, the Spirit of Prophecy, the prophetic gift. Oh, but that's not all. You know when this movement was to arise? We know exactly when. Because that same chapter, Revelation chapter 14 from verse 6, you know it as the three angels' messages, right? And the first angel's message says this. Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Now, I don't have time, as tempting as it is, to get into all of the three angels' messages. That we'll do in step by step as we go along. But here comes the first angel. There is a message that is announced, and the message is the hour of His judgment has come. Now, an astute reader of prophecy will know that that implies that there was a prophecy somewhere else in Scripture about judgment that was yet future. Daniel 8 verse 14, for unto 2,300 evenings and mornings then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. It's paralleled with the judgment scene of Daniel chapter 7. The ancient of days was brought in. Thousands upon thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousands upon ten thousands. The books were opened and the court was seated. And when you follow the structures of Daniel 7 and 8, you'll find that the cleansing of the sanctuary and the, and the judgment scene of Daniel 7 are one and the same. From two different perspectives, same great event. But the difference is that in Daniel 8 verse 14, we're told, Daniel was told, that it would still be 2,300 years into the future. You do the calculations, we do it in another time, works out to 1844. Are you with me? So from the time of Daniel, somewhere around 550 odd BC, 2,300 years from the going forth of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Daniel 9 verse 25, which you can calculate according to Ezra chapter 6 and 7, to be 457 BC, you count down 2,300, you end up in the year 1844. Did you get that? Now listen carefully. 
That was the judgment yet future. This message proclaims that the judgment is no longer future. The hour of his judgment is come. Do you get what I'm saying to you? There would be a movement that would be raised up after or around the mid 1800s that would preach that the hour of his judgment has come. And there is only one organization, organized body in this entire world that preaches the investigative judgment of Daniel chapter 8 verse 14. It is the one entirely and absolutely unique teaching in Seventh-day Adventist which you will find nowhere else and it's in this church. You'll find the Sabbath with the Seventh-day Baptists. You'll find baptism with the Baptists, hence their name. You will find the idea of sanctification and obedience to a somewhat of a degree with, with, with the Calvinists and with the Methodists. You'll find elements of truth all over the place because if you understand the history of how this movement was raised up, it is absolutely phenomenal that a group of people in this, th this time period called the Great Awakening in the United States history, and it was all around the world, by the way, Researchers showed us that the same things that were happening in the States were happening in Europe and Africa and around the world. Most prominent of which was in the US. And at about this time, a group of believers from different churches, all the churches that had been raised up out of the Reformation, the Lutherans following Luther and, and Wesley and all the rest of them, all these great reformers who had restored elements of truth, they had done what God had called them to do, coming out of the darkness of the Middle Ages. We call it the Dark Ages, not because nothing was going on, but because it is dark from a spiritual perspective. It was dark because Bibles were nailed to, 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 uh, to monastery walls because the people did not have the printed word. They were not allowed to have it on pains of death. If you were found with copies of the scriptures, you were under or subject to the sentence of death. That's why we call it the Dark Ages for spiritual reasons. And coming up out of that, God raised up men called reformers because they sought to reform the Christian church. Their intention was never to leave the Roman Catholic Church. They believed it was the right church. But when they tried to reform it, they were excommunicated and put to death. They gained pockets of believers who followed them. And they were right in so far as they went, but not one single one of those Middle, uh, Middle Ages, those Reformation churches, not one single one of them had the full truth restored unto them, like in the apostolic days. And coming out of those dark ages, 1798, the end of Roman Catholicism for a little while, the discovery of the new world, the mid-1800s, a great awakening arises. Genuine, diverging denominational uh, beliefs and backgrounds. Christians coming together to say, hey, let's not be ecumenical. Let's not just go for the lowest common denominator. They came together to study together. Baptists and Methodists and, well, there were no Adventists at that time. Because God was drawing all of these churches together and each of them brought with them an element of truth. And they would say, hey, what do you believe about this? Oh, I believe something different. Let's search it out. And they started studying the word of God. And out of that came a great revival of truth. All these collections and pieces of truth that God had raised up in different places and at different times were beginning to come back and be formed into one body. As I've studied history, I've come to the conclusion that God's intention was not multiple denominations. God's intention was one Protestant united church in truth. And there would be one church in error. And there would only be two bodies. But as those individual believers took these truths that were being rediscovered back to their churches, their churches shut them out and excommunicated them. God wanted to bring them together. That was the chance for the ecumenical movement to do its work. But those churches denied it. And God rejected those organizations because they denied truth in the same way that he rejected the Jewish nation because of their denial of the Messiah. And his hand was forced, if you want to put it that way, to form yet another group. And that group was known as the Seventh-day Adventist Church eventually. Because they had nowhere else to go and so they clubbed together and they sought for truth. And you know when it all happened? Round about the mid-1800s, right on schedule. At about the time the judgment began in heaven, the cleansing of the sanctuary. And there is no other church in this world that preaches this message of the three angels, and of the hour of his judgment is come. They'll have the commandments of God. They will believe in righteousness by faith. They would have a manifestation of the gift of prophecy. 
They would be raised up with a unique message to prepare the world for the soon coming of Jesus at exactly the right time between the coming of Jesus and the 1800s. And they would have a unique mission. Because a mission flows out of message, friends. You have nothing to do for anybody else unless you have something to offer. Does that make sense to you? You have nothing to offer the world. If, if, if you sell out on truth, then you cannot win them. They have won you. Make no mistake, friends. God has a body of believers. It's not an arrogant thing to say. Because he prophesied about it in his word. If you think it's arrogant, take it up with God. Hey, if you think you're, it's arrogant, I'd ask you what you're doing here. <laughs> it is a body that is called because they have received truth. And because they have received truth, they have a special mission to the world. And now listen carefully. The attack of the devil in this day and age on this church is to get us to give up on the uniqueness of truth. We are becoming like the Israelites of old who cried out, We want a king just like the other nations. And in doing so, they rejected God. Read the book of Samuel. You are called to be a holy people. A people of truth. A community of faith that stands for the principles of God's word. Who has a unique mission to the world. Who believes in the coming of Jesus. Obedience to his commandments and righteousness by faith. And follows the scripture and the end day manifestation of the gift of prophecy. And you need make no apology to anyone for believing that. Because it's based in the truth of the word. I want to challenge you, friends, to take up your Bible and to pray for revival. I want to challenge you, young people, as you go out there and you go to university and you start making decisions about careers and life partners, boyfriends and girlfriends. I want to ask you, has the truth sanctified you? Are you making your decisions based on the truth of the word or what feels good and feels right, great in the moment? I remember standing on dance floors. The lasers were going. We were at the house parties or the Goa trance uh, 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 dance parties and so on. And there we were on the dance floor. It was just, you know, it was nuts. It was going off. And we're, 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 we're high on ecstasy, LSD and speed and everything else. And I remember shouting to my friend across, across the din of the music. We'd be like, dude, this is so, feels so good. How can it be wrong? And that is the same philosophy that's moving through the Christian world today. If it feels good and there's a supernatural manifestation, it must be the moving of God. And they forget we're in the midst of a great controversy and the enemy has the power to deceive and he makes himself look like an angel of light. The only way you will ever know what is truth and be prevented from deception, friends, is if you surrender to the truth of God's word and you follow it down to the last little bit. I'm begging you and I'm pleading with you. Return to our heritage. Become a people of the book. Search these things out. Study it for yourself. Seek not only a head knowledge, but a heart experience with God. And take up those old-fashioned writings called the Spirit of Prophecy and read them. You think you don't need them? Well, God thought you did. That's why he gave it. Read it. Study it. Apply it. If you think that stuff's old-fashioned, you might as well throw this book away too because it's much older. But it's for your good. God has tried to stay in contact with you and me through the revelation of his word. He's given us a way we can navigate the straits of the end time deceptions. And he will take this church and its people into the harbor. Before the end, friend, there will be a mighty revival of the true Holy Spirit. And I want every single one of us here to be a part of that. I want you to sing with us the last two songs, the, last, the, last, or the first two verses of a song which is dear to me. Give me the Bible. Holy message shining. I want you to think about this, friends, the first two verses. And I'm going to make an appeal to you this morning. I want you to make a decision in your heart. Let's sing these first two verses, and I pray that you will sing it from your heart as a prayer.
friends, this morning I want to make an appeal for special prayer. There's anyone here this morning that realizes I need to know Jesus better. I want to ask the Lord to come into my life. I'm, I've been walking with the Lord. We're not questioning that. But we want the truth of God to saturate our being. We want to have special prayer and dedication for that. I want you, as we sing this last, uh, last verse, just to come forward here and we'll have special prayer. Thank you for all that you have done in giving your son. All that you have done in taking the time to reveal the truth through the word and through the prophets. And we have to acknowledge this one more. The preacher has to acknowledge that we, that I, am slow of hearing. Slow to accept, Lord, at times, rebellious of heart, insistent on my own way, and we come this morning to confess our sin again. We humble our hearts, Lord, and we pray that you will do whatever it takes in our lives to get us ready for your coming, for your soon coming. Let not one of us or any of our families be lost, Lord. And may that work begin in our hearts afresh today. Teach us the joy that there is in surrender. The freedom of following the truth. The protection that comes from walking within your grace and your mercy, within your word. Make us disciples who abide in your word is our prayer. Those who have come forward in a special way, Lord, I pray, let your Holy Spirit rain down upon us. Take us back to the time of the apostles. Let there be such a revival of primitive godliness amongst us as has not been seen since apostolic times. Grant to us the true Holy Spirit. Take away our hunger and our desire for the junk food of the world. And sanctify us by your truth. Our prayer this morning, in Jesus' name. <laughs>
Good morning, church. We're in the Gospel of John this morning. We're going to look at quite a few different passages, actually. But uh, most of them are in John, so we're going to jump around a little bit. This is a message which I have been meditating on for a while, and it comes out of questions that I've asked myself for a long time, ever since giving my heart to the Lord, ever since uh, choosing to join the Fellowship of the Adventist Church, some of the questions that have, that have led to my meditation on this topic. And we're going to start here in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31, 32, and 36. Jesus, of course, is dialoguing with the Jews, with the Pharisees. And uh, as it usually went in such a case, it wasn't always the easiest of conversations. And uh, he got himself into a whole lot of trouble for saying these words. And so here we go. John chapter 8 from verse 31, 32, and 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word... You are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. There are a number of uh, concepts tied up together here. We have the person of Jesus. He brings freedom. We have the concept of truth, which brings freedom. We have the concept of the word because his disciples are instructed to abide in his word. And the word is connected to truth because immediately after he says, you are my disciples if you abide in my word, he goes on to say, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And then you have the idea of discipleship. Discipleship, the word, truth, and the person of Jesus. Interesting combination of ideas here. In essence, what he is saying to, to these folks, to these Jews, these, of course, are the ones who believed him in the positive, in the hearing of those who were challenging him and disagreeing with him, is he is saying to him, truth is paramount to the concept of freedom. Truth is paramount to the concept of freedom. You cannot be free without being in truth. Now, this is a very interesting concept. It's interesting that Jesus himself puts such weight on it. And we'll go to a few other texts in a, few, in a few moments that will really add emphasis to what Jesus is saying here. It's interesting in the 21st century because the idea in the 21st century has departed somewhat from the idea of the truth shall make you free. The emphasis now is on Jesus shall make you free. Now, you're thinking, Adrian, what's wrong with that? Surely you're not going to stand up there as a minister of the gospel, and say, that's not true. No, I'm not. Indeed, that's what Jesus himself said. The Son shall make you free. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. But there is a casual use of the term in Christianity in general. There is a very blasé, no substance to the meaning of this idea that Jesus shall set you free. Because I ask you, who is Jesus aside from truth? What do you know about Jesus aside from revealed truth? You know nothing except the name. Nothing except the name. The devil himself would be happy for you to call him Jesus. If that's what it would take to get you to worship him. He doesn't mind you calling him Jesus. As long as you don't understand the substance of that name. Is it true that if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed? I would say to you, absolutely. But my question is, do you know who the Son is? My question is, do you know the Jesus who makes you free? Do you know more than merely the name Jesus? Do you call on the very being of Jesus or do you just profess the name of Jesus? I want to challenge this idea that we have in Christianity today that truth takes a second place. It's just all about the casual mention of the name of Jesus. And that therefore we as a people, Seventh-day Adventists, raised up in a prophetic message for this time in earth's history as a movement akin to that of John the Baptist to warn the world and prepare it for the coming of the, of the Messiah, that we could somehow align ourselves with this sort of a movement. We call it the ecumenical movement. 
The ecumenical movement is the idea that, hey, let's not talk about our differences. Let's not study the Bible to, to differentiate between what is truth and error. Let's get together on the lowest common denominator amongst us all. And usually, usually that's on the feel-good emotional element.